Deb Fox, the Chief Nursing Officer of University Medical Center of Southern Nevada in Las Vegas, had a temper tantrum about a week ago in the form of a letter that she mailed to all of her employees. And one of those blessed humans sent it to the internet for us to critique. And we're going to do that today. We're also going to look at it and see what we can kind of learn from it and apply it to our own lives. But mostly we're going to have fun and uh, just kind of tear it apart a little bit. Let's go. Hello there. If you're new, I'm Liz. I am a family nurse practitioner. And on this channel, I like to talk about nursing things, healthcare things, lifey things, all the things. And today we are embracing our sass, okay? Because Deb, Deb Fox, she is the chief nursing officer, like I said, of UMC. And she came out with this very bold letter. Um, I feel like she's going through something uh, and uh, we're going to go through it with her. And it's going to be a good time. She came out with this letter on what? Um, March 7th. 2022. And well, we'll just read it. We'll go line by line and I'll tell you all about it. What kind of voice should we give Deb? I feel like Deb would kind of have a dear nursing colleagues. I have no idea what Deb looks like or what she sounds like, but today she's going to sound like this. CNO, just in case you are wondering, is chief nursing officer. This CNO flash report is the most difficult one I have had to write you as a chief nursing officer. Now, this is a very interesting point because Deb, Deb has worked here at this hospital since at least 2015. I looked up since the hospital, like a public hospital, um, it, you can look up all the records. So that would made this a very interesting investigation and the pay records. I could look up like what she's made. We'll look at that. But I found something is like back until 2015, the records online didn't go pack further than that. So we know she's at least worked at the university medical center since 2015. This is interesting because she says this is the most difficult letter that she has had to write. Let's just conceptualize that. So she thinks this letter is more difficult than anything she's had to send out during the pandemic because she's been the chief nursing officer during the entire pandemic. So this is harder than when we were going through a worldwide pandemic. Interesting. This must be pretty big news. But we also had the horrible event that happened at Mandalay Bay where many, many people were requiring trauma care in 2017. She was the CNO during that too. I'm assuming she had to send out some kind of a letter to the staff because that would be really traumatizing to have that many trauma patients come in. And they would have seen a lot of this because they are Nevada's only level one and um, trauma center and the pediatric level two trauma center. So they would have gotten all of those patients that were coming in during that horrible event. So for her to just say that this was the hardest letter she has ever had to write, I just thought that was bold. So just keep that in the back of all of our minds as Deb thought this was harder than all of those things together. So let's find out what Deb thought was so difficult because this... This is intriguing. In response to the discontinuation of crisis incentive pay, actions demonstrated by some of our nursing department members surprised and saddened me. Well, during COVID, a lot of hospitals gave extra pay to nurses and other healthcare staff. Uh, some hospitals gave them extra money to say like, oh, this is crisis pay. What it really was, was trying to get them to stay. Because if you've watched some of my other videos, particularly the one about travel nursing, I will leave it linked at the end in case you want to check that one out. We talked about capping travel nursing pay and how a lot of people were leaving the units to go um, do travel nursing. And we saw a lot of people being like, hey, a lot of nurses being like, hey, I can go somewhere else and make a lot more money. So these hospitals eventually said, OK, like we will pay to try to retain you. So a lot of those hospitals are now trying to like back off of that. They're saying we're not going to do hazard pay. You know, the pandemic is it's still here, but like, you know, it's been years. So like we're over it. Let's go back to normal. And they're pulling back the incentive pay. And apparently at this hospital, people were upset. They were sad when they started making less money. And it's odd to me like that she thinks it surprised and saddened me the reaction. So I'm assuming people were upset. I would be upset if you took away money that I was making. Even if I understood that this was temporary pay, if you took away my temporary pay, I would still be sad. And it's totally okay to feel sad when someone takes something from you. So I don't know why Deb is trying to like, you know, gaslight our feelings right here. Uh, but she is. So lesson number one from this video is you are always allowed to have your feelings. Don't let anyone ever tell you how you're allowed to feel something about it. And if they're mad because of how you're feeling, that's a them problem, not a you problem. Okay. Okay. Let's just get that settled. Now, this question also brought up a couple other feelings inside of me. I was like, so if people were 
upset. Are they upset because the pay went back or are they upset because now the pay went back and they realized like, wow, I'm really underpaid. You know, what are we looking at here? Are you like a little bit sad because things are back to normal or like a lot bit sad? Cause now you're like, Oh, like I'm being taken advantage of. And so I decided to look into that and I found it was definitely the latter one. So let's take a peek really quick at what nurses at this hospital make compared to nurses in Las Vegas in general. Like, are, are you equally compensated? And the answer was no. So that, that's probably why people were especially mad and maybe they had an even bigger reaction, Deb, is because you don't you don't pay them very well. I will leave links to all of this information down below. Like I said, it's public information. You can just go and look up how who makes what at this hospital. It was, it was a stark contrast between <laughs> how the pay is differentiated. But a nurse at this hospital in 2019, all of our data is from 2019, which isn't ideal, but that's the last time they like really put it out there in a easy to download off the internet way. So in 2019, a average salary for a nurse at this hospital was $36 an hour. So if you are working, let's say 36 hours a week, that's three twelves. Um, that is going to come out to $67,000 a year. She might be like, Hey, that's commendable. Um, but let's look at what everyone else in Las Vegas is making for nursing average of $92,000, 700 and 20 cents. Obviously that's going to be some variation, but it is saying that 92,000 is about the average for the nurse in Las Vegas. And remember we were at 67,000. So Deb, that's probably why people were pretty upset is because you probably really crunched that gap. You know, maybe, you know, $44 an hour here is about the average and you're averaging, let's see, 36. So maybe it, you know, even if they got like five bucks, like that might've brought them a little bit closer, but I think people are probably having such a reaction because you don't, you don't seem to pay them very well. Deb. I also went on a little side tangent and I'm like, I wonder how much Deb makes because Deb seems to be making this a big, like, um, you know, why are you complaining so much of a problem? So I'm sure Deb also, I'm sure Deb's a nurse. She's probably getting hit with this equally, right? I'm sure that Deb's getting hit with this equally. So let's just hop over. Oh, and see how much Deb makes. Okay. Deborah Fox. She's the chief. Oh, oh, $321,977 is Deb's salary. So that's interesting. Um, cause remember that nursing salaries are sitting at 67,000. I found this fun statistic that her salary is 265% higher than the average UMC employee, which we also can look at really quick because it's just kind of sad and highlights how we do not compensate people very well at all within healthcare. Like it's very tiered, you know, the people who are physicians and executives like her, they're getting paid. I mean, physicians, they work hard, they go to med school. It's a whole thing, but like Deb is making $300,000 a year and the really difficult day-to-day -day job, uh, I looked up like housekeepers cause they work so hard and literally keep the hospital running. Like it's a hospital, it's very messy and it would completely shut down if we didn't have wonderful humans who, you know, and they're like, oh, our housekeepers were just like the bomb. Um, how much do housekeepers make? I looked up cause I was like, this would be interesting. Um, and I found this facility services makes $24,000 a year. So I made a graph um, because I thought it would be, you know, good, jolly fun. So we have down here facility services um, making $24,000 a year, nursing making 67. And then Deb, Deb is making this much. Uh, here I added the UMC average in there as well, which was 44,000. Um, but that was an average you'll have to remember. So most people are not making that much money to get to 44,000. We have the people who are all making like half a million and brought it down. Fun fact, the CEO is making $877,000, but this video is not about them. So we won't go there, but Deb, maybe people are upset and you don't understand, um, because you're not paying them well, but you're paying yourself well. So this is already starting to look like, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you little peasant, why are you complaining? Well, that's why they're complaining, Deb. That's why they're complaining. Okay, let's, let's go to the next point. We seem to have forget how to speak English, Deb. We seem to have forget how to speak English. We seem to have forget the positive things already done to ensure safe staffing and nurse well-being. It is, so it is important to remind everyone of these initiatives because they reflect an overwhelming commitment to you as employees and professionals. 
So here, <laughs> Deb kind of becomes who, I forgot to read it in my voice. I should have done a Professor Umbridge voice because I feel like that's who she's really embodying. Sure, we're all going to be very good friends. Like, we seem to have forgotten, you know, in that like super sickeningly sweet thing where she is trying to be pals with you, even though we know she's not pals because she makes like six of what we make. Um, and she's saying we as like such a derogatory, you know, it's how you talk down to people where you're like, how are we doing? Like, are we frustrated today? You know, when you're talking like that and automatically it puts people, it feels like you're being talked down to, like you're a toddler. I don't even talk to my toddlers like that. Very, very demeaning way she's talking here. And this is actually like sending a lot of like abuse, like emotional abuse alarm bells off in my head um, saying, you know, we are doing so much for you. What on earth are you complaining about? So I looked up what are some different signs of emotional abuse? Um, so if we look over here, we have I found this random article from Healthline because I feel like it laid out a lot of good examples. I went through and we're going to play how many signs of emotional abuse can we find within this article? And it's going to be staggering and unfortunate how many there are. And I'm pointing this out mostly just to show you so that if you ever find this in your employer, you can be like, oh, that's a red flag. Like, this is not a me problem. This is a you problem. It's the employer problem. We need to talk about this stuff so that it doesn't happen anymore. You know, the more we raise awareness of it and we let you people know, like, this is not normal and it should not happen the more we can fix it because nursing and healthcare in general have this really odd thing where we accept treatment from our employers that no one like other fields would never dream of uh, and they get away with it and it's insanity. Okay. So we have the condescending tone. We have saying things like we are already taking such good care of you. Doesn't that remind you of someone who is like in a, in like, if they're abusive and they're saying like, you have it so good, no one else would treat you, you know, like I'm taking care of you really setting the groundwork for you being like, oh, you know, like you do take care of me. You know, if I left other people might not take care of me quite as nicely. Um, we're seeing here, one of the signs of the abuse was using guilt. They might try to guilt trip you, you know, look at all I've done for you in an attempt to get your way. So really like laying the groundwork hard there. Um, pretending that it was for our well-being. Um, and it's going to be very interesting to see what they thought was for the nurse's well-being because it's not something that I would consider going above and beyond. It would just be like, Deb, that's your job. <laughs> your job is to give me an environment in which it is safe to work in. I don't need to thank you for that. Like, why is that the ex why is that a high bar where you're like, come on, we tried to give you livable working conditions. So um let's look into that. But yeah, fun fact, um, going back to the we thing, never talk to people like that. That's not a good way to get anyone to ever be on your side, ever. Also, if nurses were really well taken care of, if you as a human are well taken care of, you don't need to be reminded, right? You wouldn't be like, we wouldn't need to forget. It's not that they forgot, Deb. They just, they know. <laughs> they know that they're not being treated well because you don't forget that you're being treated well, okay? People who are being treated well don't need the reminders. So, all right, let's see what um, Deb thinks she's done so wonderfully for all of us nurses. I'm just pretending I'm one of you, UMC nurses. I'm sorry. Overall, UMC has spent tens of millions of dollars on travel nurses, local and national recruitment efforts, including NSI, hero bonuses and market adjustments, merit increases and cost of living adjustments, establishing an internal resource pool, keeping multiple nurses over many months who, when there was no clinical work for them, that is nice. That is nice, Deb. Thank you for that. That was very kind to not let them go during COVID and providing an extremely generous crisis incentive. So here Deb is laying out um, that she did her job and we're supposed to be grateful. Um, and you had to spend tens of millions of dollars on like travel nurses. Uh, also like keeping in mind that tens of millions of jobs, this hospital made, I think, uh, a large number of money, like a large amount of money, billions of dollars. That's not their profit. They're also a nonprofit, which just means they kind of like, they can't show that they made money. But um, <laughs> if you look on the interwebs, it's very curious that they, you can, I looked into all their like financial reports that they had at their financial meetings, which Deb was at. And they're saying that, you know, if you look, they made more money than they've ever made in the last few years. They have paid down more debt and they've invested more in other companies um, more than they ever have. So 
yes, they they're okay. You spent tens of millions of dollars having to fill holes of nursing staff. Congratulations. But like, that's literally your job Deb, is to keep the nursing department afloat. Um, they recruited people. They spent a lot of money recruiting people. Thanks Deb. I appreciate that. Hero bonuses. I don't know what those are. Um, uh, market adjustments, merit increases. So like, oh, you did a good job at your job and you're going to get a raise. Wow. That's not like that happens in any other career. You're really setting a high bar, Deb. Um, cost of living adjustments. Wow. <laughs> what a gem. You're trying, you're not even, you're not matching inflation, but you're like giving us a little bit. We appreciate that. Establishing an internal resource pool. Deb, why didn't you have that before? So in case you don't know, internal resource pool, our hospital called it CSR, like central staffing resource, where you would have a pool of nurses who would kind of go and fill holes. You know, they would float to different units, a float pool, wherever they were. Because if a nurse calls out or is on vacation, instead of mandating and making nurses stay to fill those holes, they just kind of pull you know, from the pool and patch holes and they can go around to a bunch of different units. It's a very normal thing to have. And I'm worried why Deb didn't have one before. I'm like, Deb, what did you do before? Did you mandate all your nurses? And we're going to get to that. Uh, but I'm worried. I'm like this, this was something you just made. Yikes, Deb. Um, keeping multiple nurses. Okay. Yes. That was very nice. Thank you, Deb, for not firing those nurses in the middle of a pandemic because you couldn't do your, um, you know, your, elective surgeries. That was very kind and providing an extremely generous crisis incentive, which we should remind people it's because you're paying people $30,000 less than the people at the other hospitals nearby. So that's probably why you had to have it be extremely generous. But I'm just saying that was, that was nice of you to pay them a fair wage for a little while there. Now we're not there and now we're not allowed to be sad that we're not there, but I digress. Also going down this line, I uh, thought that if you had to provide what you would call an extremely generous crisis incentive. That either means that you're not getting paid enough, which we already know they were getting paid a lot less than their peers in other hospitals, but you're probably not also giving them great benefits because people don't generally want to, you have to give incentives so people stay. And if people feel respected and appreciated in their role, um, internally without you having to force the like feelings onto them, Deb, they want to stay. And that's things like, like good benefits, um, being paid. Well, I did look into their, benefits package. And it really wasn't like terrible. They get a fairly decent amount of time off. It doesn't look awful. I don't know what their actual insurance plans look like um, in terms of health insurance, but I'll leave this link down below. You can look at it. It doesn't look, you know, it doesn't look terrible at all. Um, uh, so that really would lead me back to, you just don't pay them enough because they're getting like a decent amount of vacation time. They also were probably not like treated super well. Um, if their benefits package looks pretty decent um, and you were giving them more money. So if people are still leaving, it's probably because you're mean, Deb. I hate to tell you, it's because they probably don't feel appreciated where they work. All right, let's see. And Deb, I feel really bad like pointing this out to you, but every hospital pretty much had to pay incentive pay. So, I mean, I'm good for you that you did it, but like, you're not a special because you had to give some incentive pay. So let's really quick, take another step back and look at this through the lens of like, is this an emotionally abusive relationship that we have going on with Deb? And I think we're going to see some red flags because this is playing majorly into the disputing your feelings thing. When people were like, I feel sad that you took my money away. And Deb is like, um, you shouldn't even be angry about that. Like, what do you have to feel sad about? Look at all these things I did for you. So taking your feelings and saying, those aren't valid. I'm nice to you. Instead of just saying like, I hear your feelings. Okay. No, she's fighting back and being like, look at all I've done for you. I'm the best. Um, I, I don't even know why you're sad because I give you all of these things. Okay, Deb. Uh, and, but you might be watching this being like Deb, but Liz, Deb kind of has a point. Like, you know, I'm not totally seeing why you're so upset about this letter. Just wait. So Deb goes on to, on the next page, say the UMC um, incentive amounts far exceed those offered by other hospitals in the community. Again, look at all I've done for you. What do you, you know, look, we're so good. In addition, many UMC departments who were also in staffing extremists. I really was hoping that this was another typo by Deb, but in fact, it was staffing extremists. Extremists just means like really difficult, um, basically extreme conditions. She was just saying this to sound fancy. I think staffing extremists did not receive crisis pay incentive. So again, 
Um, we're looking at what do you have to feel sad about? Other people have it so much worse. And that's another common thing in any kind of abusive relationship is other people have it so much worse. So like, why are you even complaining? You know, that it could be, you know, you could be this other terrible situation and it makes you as the person usually feel like, oh my gosh, you're right. Like I should just be grateful for what I have. Even if you're not treating me very kindly, I should be grateful because other people have it worse. And that's abuse. Don't let anyone ever tell you that. Okay, good. Deb seems to be in the mindset here that like, just because she treats people a certain way, um, it's impossible for her to think like, I treat people poorly and other people also treat people poorly. No, it's like, well, they get treated poorly. So obviously you get treated better. No, Deb, like two things can both be terrible. It really reminds me of like the residents and the nurses conflict where the residents are complaining that, you know, whenever nurses want any kind of improvement, residents are always like, you have it so good. You're making more money than us. And like, we work so many more hours rather than being like, Hey, this is like a problem we both have. We can both fight it. Like let's team up instead. The residents attack the nurses, um, because residents work like hours from hell. So rather than working together, a lot of times there's conflict there. And it's like, they're setting us against each other rather than like, we should probably team up and be like, Hey, hospital, you're really screwing us all over. And maybe we'd actually get somewhere, but that's kind of what it reminds me of. I feel like Deb's playing into that for us. So at this point, Deb's like not looking great. We're kind of like, Deb, I'm not loving your attitude, Deb, but I'm like, you know, I'm not like truly fired up. Um, so you should hold on to that feeling if you don't want to be angry because it's about to, it's going to change. Ready? UMC discontinued crisis pay on February 22nd, 2022. What a day. Uh, for three reasons. First, there was no longer a need to continue this expense when our dynamic staffing needs could have been managed using voluntary standby and extra shift and overtime shifts. So what Deb is saying here is if you had just volunteered nurses to work extra than the contract that we had agreed on. So I said I would employ you for 36 hours and you show up for 36 hours. If you had volunteered more and signed up for more overtime, we wouldn't have this staffing issue. This entire thing would have never happened. We never would have had to give incentive pay because no one would have left. So we wouldn't have to try to retain people with money. None of this would have happened. This is all your fault. So don't be mad at me. I'm actually mad at you is what Deb is saying, which is very, very abusive. As we can see, blaming you for the problem when things go wrong, they blame you. Deb, I feel like you're blaming me. Um, if you had only been a better employee, a more supportive employee, if you had picked up more overtime, then life would be better. We wouldn't even have this issue. Oh, come on now. It's also like being just like very derogatory saying that, you know, like, how dare you not pick up how these hours, how dare you set this boundary with me? How dare you, you know, implying like laziness and that they just don't want to like work for it. Um, this is also going back to like, you know, telling them that, you know, it's very mean of you. Like, I, I don't like that you had this negative reaction. Like that makes you a negative person versus like it just being a normal thing to respond to something bad. So that was something that Deb said. <laughs> that was a choice. Um, so this is all the nurse's problem, which bold statement. Um, I don't agree at all. So now that we know how Deb really feels about that, that this is all of our fault in the beginning, um, what else was the problem? So the second one was every hospital in the community offered incentives also had discontinued them. So everyone else was being done. So there's no reason for us, you know, they're being mean. So we're going to be mean too. Um, also this was less of a problem for other hospitals because remember they were still making like 30 grand more. So maybe Deb, maybe this isn't quite like, we're not comparing apples and apples. It's like apples and cucumbers or something because they're paying them and you're not. So that's a problem. If we're looking at it through the thing of like, is this an abusive tactic from an employer. Um, yes. Kind of just think about it this way. So they're saying like, you know, if you had done this, this wouldn't be happening. And before you try to internalize it and be like, but that's kind of true. Think about it in a relationship sense. If you were like, well, Jan's husband hits her. So it's fine if I hit you too. That's not okay. That's not <laughs> just because the other hospital doesn't mean it's doing it. Doesn't mean you need to do it too. Okay. Deb, that's not what we need to do. That's not the look we're going for. Okay. And are we ready for the final straw of Deb's argument? Because it is 
It's bound to be good. Um, third, it was apparent that the crisis incentive pay option was no longer being valued as a short-term way of recognizing those going above and beyond, but rather as an expectation of entitlement. So this is no longer something that like, like I'm giving you this gift. This is what Deb's thinking, I'm giving you this gift and you don't even appreciate it anymore. You come to expect it, but that's very interesting, Deb, because the entire reason we need this, remember, is the supply and demand problem. So in the United States, we've decided that healthcare is a for-profit business, which is like, um, you know, so it's working in a capitalist society. So we have supply and demand. Okay. So when the supply of nurses go down, the demand goes up, which means the price that the nurses can charge for their services also goes up. Deb doesn't like this when it's nurses making profit. Deb only likes it when it works for like her advantage and the hospital's advantage. Um, normally they really like this supply and demand thing uh, so they can keep investing and paying down their loans and everything, except for when it's their employees that are the ones that are in demand all of a sudden. They don't really like that as much. Um, but Deb, that's how this works. Okay. You pay us money. And then I don't like, I don't feel entitled to it. I just realized like, oh, this is my market value right now. So yes, I expect that. So, um, <laughs> it's allowed, oh, it's okay for people to feel like proud of their self-worth and know their value <laughs> and for them to stand up for it and fight for it and expect that. That's like, you know, if you're like, if we look at this again, like from an abusive relationship, if you are being treated a certain way and you ex and like, you're like, Oh, this doesn't feel right. Like, cause I expect to be loved and valued and respected and like sought after that's okay. You're not being high maintenance or anything. You are just being a respected, a respected human. Okay. So if anyone is not treating you how you feel like you deserve, then leave employer relate like partner, any friend, this applies to all areas of life. Okay. Because you deserve to be treated well. You are wonderful and valuable and brilliant and never let anyone tell you anything otherwise, especially Deb. Deb's really, Deb's, Deb needs some therapy. <laughs> we need some serious couples counseling, Deb. Deb, you, uh, this is going to put a really big wedge in our relationship. I don't know if we're going to come back from it. And I don't even work there. I can't imagine your employees, how they must feel. If any of you work at UMC, feel free to leave your anonymous feelings below. Uh, use a Google account that's not associated with your name. You're not going to want that on here. But I would be curious to hear if any of you do work there or like around there or hear about this, your thoughts. I mean, or your just thoughts in general, but especially if you work there. So that's what Deb said about that. Those are her three points of why she discontinued the pay. Um, I also just think it's very interesting that like, could you ever imagine a male dominated field being talked to like this? No, because they would not take it. They would be like laughed out of town. Uh, so that's why, again, we're sharing this so we can learn to advocate for ourselves and be like, oh yeah, this is not normal. <laughs> like this is emotionally abusive from my employer and I will not tolerate it. Okay. We're all going to channel that energy because I talked about this with my husband and he laughed he, at me. He was like, are you kidding me? He's like, if they ever came into my office, he works in computers and tried to talk to us like that, like you would just get laughed out. So <laughs> let's channel that energy friends, shall we? Moving on. So what's your plan, Deb? What's the, so you've scolded us. You've told us that you don't like, we are sad. The fact that we're sad. Is there anything? And you've told us why you're taking away our compensation. So, um, obviously that's it, right? No, Deb, no, Deb, Deb has other things to also tell us in this letter. Pour a little salt in the wound. UMC has already met with SEIU, which is a, a union that has like like a national union though. It has like 101.9 million people in it that are in all different public sectors. So it's not just for nurses. It sounds like they're probably not a great union. I've worked at a union hospital. Ours was just for our hospital though. And then we were, they would go and fight for you with a whole bunch of things. Um, unions, let me know if you want me to do a whole video on them. Future video mug. Did you like that? My sister got it for me. We'll talk about it in a future video. Oh, I probably need to focus it. There we go. Future video mug. Um, but we do. Um, I mean, if you want me to talk about unions, I really liked mine. I felt like they really did fight for us. This one seems pretty useless because they met with them and uh, they're going to now enact in order um, <laughs> to fix, you know, they're cutting back on a lot of things uh, and they still don't have enough nurses. So um, obviously their plan wasn't working because they were feeling entitled. Uh, people were probably still leaving because um, they're mean. So now they're also going to take away your money and enact mandatory over like extra shifts and overtime, mandatory extra shifts and overtime will begin March 16th. And the signup process will begin March 14th. So keep in mind, this came out on the seventh. So she's giving them a week's notice that, Hey, you're going to start having to pick up extra shifts. 
And what mandatory overtime is, if you're unfamiliar, is basically when your employer says, hey, you know how we had contracted with you to work 36 hours a week? Well, now you have to pick up an extra eight hour shift or 12 hour shift every two weeks or every month, or you have to add on extra to the beginning or the end of your shift and you must do it. Um, and they usually set a time parameter. It looks like in the next, yep, it's going to be 60 days um, that they're going to have for this. It's going to be 60 days that they can, that they're setting out as the estimate of how long at least this will go, then they can extend that and they can make you stay. So that is one type of overtime. Another um, of mandated overtime, they can also this one you sign up for, it looks like. So they already know they have the gaps and the holes in the schedule, even though they have the resource pool now, go figure. Uh, so this is like an ongoing problem, obviously. Um, the other thing that can happen just as like a fun fact is they can keep you at the end of your shift. So if you're there, you've worked 12 and a half hours and there's no one, they're lacking nurses on the next shift, they can just make you stay. Um, it like I call it holding you hostage and it is what it is. Different hospitals have different rules. Um, about overtime in general, my hospital, you could work eight hours. You could only be mandated, like forced to work eight extra hours, I believe in a month or it might've been in a pay period, but, um, either way, it's never fun to be forced to work extra, you know, very big difference between volunteering for overtime and being forced. So I thought this was very unique, Deb, that you chose to not only take away their extra money, scold them for feeling sad about that, tell them that they're being like having you take care of their basic needs as an employee is like you being going above and beyond and then tell them that you're, they are, they are the reason for the staffing problem in the first place and then force them to do overtime all in one letter. I mean, I was, that's bold, Deb. That was, that was bold. Well done. So she says attached, you'll find the updated guidelines, frequently asked questions, the sign up process in order to sign up for the overtime. Um, it's going to be 60 days. She can extend it um, using that's usually they'll meet back with like the union and bargain, like figure out how much longer I found on the internet um, on a Reddit thread that someone who had worked there said the longest they've had mandatory overtime at this hospital is seven months. Hang on one second. Yes. Hi. You just wake up from your nap. You need a snuggle. Ooh, oh, my knee. My gimpy. How many left are outside there? Oh my goodness. Millions. So many. Too many to count. I think. Well, we, we don't have that many food. But, well, outside has lots of food. Think of all the dirt and the, I don't know what bugs eat. All right. It's a lot of feelings in my house right now. Um, they're with their dad. They're fine. If you hear screams, let's just move on from it. They're totally fine. I just won't let them eat an entire tray of brownies right now. So they are, they're a little bit angry. Toddlers are toddlers or something else. Um, so Deb, uh, Deb laid this out. She said 60 days, you know, we're going to look at this. I'm going to, I would be curious to know what kind of, um, how much overtime they were going to be required to do. You know, is it eight hours a month? Is it 12 hours a month? Is it 12 hours a week? You know, like, what are we really looking at? Cause that really changes the whole, like, I mean, it's always bad uh, when someone breaks a contract and says, no, you have to do more or you're going to get fired, which is an ultimatum. Also a red flag, you know, never, ever good when someone else is not holding up you know, their side of the deal. Um, and, uh, Deb really goes and, um, Deb goes out with a bang here. Cause she's like, you know, this hasn't been enough. I have not laid enough on you. Let's just go. Let's, let's really see how I can knock this out of the park. Nurses can positively affect the duration of mandatory extra shifts and overtime by voluntarily collaborating with us to address various unit staffing needs by signing up or volunteering for extra shifts. I am open to reconsidering executing the mandatory extra shift plan, but that is predicated on the actions of UMC nurses moving forward. So basically she is saying, based on your behavior, if you behave well, if you're good little nurses, then I might think of reducing your punishment. And that, that is never, that's not okay. Especially when there's this power dynamic, you know, between... Uh, <laughs> Like it, that, that, that's just, that's not okay. If your behavior is going to lessen a punishment or a sentence, you know, and there's this power dynamic where she holds all the power over the nurses, you know, nurses claim your power back and be like, no, bye. Um, because this is prioritizing Deb's needs above nurses needs, which is a sign of abuse. Well, they expect to do what you want when they want you to do it. They think you should always prioritize their needs to do things to their standards. And you shouldn't hang out. Like, you know, you shouldn't do what's going to be right for you. You need to do what's right for Deb. 
And that's not okay here, especially when she is forcing you into doing something. Um, it's just, it's not okay. And then she signs off the letter with, as always, like as always, what? As always, I'm the worst, Deb. As always, you suck, nurses, Deb. Like as always, what? Let's le leave me, let me know what you think that as always is in the comments below. That will be an excellent, that'll be fun. It'll also make the YouTube gods happy because they like engagement and um, they're mad with my snarky comments lately. Actually, I think my audience is just like, what, what, this is not what I signed up for. And I'm like, but this is, it's what's feeding my soul. So if you're watching these, I appreciate you. Oh, there will be educational content coming back next week. I think I have something. I just have a lot of snark in my soul that needed to come out. Um, so yeah, let's just recap with Deb. Deb um, blamed nurses for the problem that she created and then said that we should feel grateful that this is, that, that we were, that they were receiving like the base, you know, employee, basic things of safety that you would expect as an employee and then punished them for the problem that she created and then said that if, but if they were good little nurses and accepted their punishment happily, then she might not renew it and maybe it wouldn't go beyond 60 days. So fascinating. I'm also seeing my war crime, my war wounds, um, toddler wounds. It's fine. I'm fine. Um, so that was, uh, interesting. Deb, no one is ever going to forcing people. It's not a good look. I don't think we ever, no one ever like when they're forced to do something is usually enthusiastic about it. That's a terrible way to convince people to do something. Um, not a fan of, you know, making people do things by force, especially when you're in a contract together where you both agreed on the terms, like, Hey, I agree to work here for this many hours. It is, um, no, what this really is bringing back is a lot of the feelings of, you know, Deb is treating this much more like a, a calling of like nurses, like, Oh, the profession, this, you know, you owe this to your community to keep them safe. You have to show up and do this when in reality, like we just did a live about, um, nursing being a job, not a calling. If it's not that way for you, that's okay. But we really need to look at it that way because otherwise it opens the door to a ton of manipulation from our employers as we're seeing, because now they're saying, Hey, but you have to do this, you know, um, because you should have just volunteered for it anyway. You know, like that's your moral failing that you already didn't do that. If you want to check that video out, I will leave it at the end here. We go into a lot of more of like the ethics behind it and give you some pointers of how to avoid being manipulated by your employer. Um, because they're going to try to make it just like Deb has made it seem like it's a you issue. You're the problem here, not Deb, but it's Deb. It's always Deb or the hospital. It's not you being a moral failing for not wanting to work more for not having gone above and beyond enough to get into the situation. This is just the situation and it's Deb's problem. It's literally her job to fix this, not yours. You are not the problem, even though the hospitals and everything will say like, Oh, you know, um, if you don't want to sign up for this overtime, if you don't want to do this, like your friends are going to suffer your other friends on the unit, you know, they're not going to have enough staff. They're going to be understaffed. The patients are going to suffer. That's manipulation. That's trying to make you feel bad because they aren't prepared enough or willing to do the things to get more nurses, willing to provide the incentives to get more nurses in. And that's a them problem. So <laughs> that was that. And I hated it, but also kind of loved it at the same time because it was so bad. It's like, how could I write the worst temper tantrum letter ever? And De Deb nailed it. So, I mean, on that, Deb, excellent job. I would absolutely love to hear any of your thoughts you have surrounding this. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Where do you just like rant with me in the feelings about this? Remember, if you work there, you know, someone that works here, I'd love all the tea, leave it down below. Um, <laughs> and like, is your hospital doing this? Do you still have incentive crisis pay? Has your CNO written a tantrum letter? Please send it to me. I would love to see it. Huge shout out. And thanks to my friend Rhonda, um, who sent this to me. And she was like, I need to know your feelings about this. And I was like, oh, Rhonda, I have so many feelings. So if you ever find anything where you're like, I need to know, I mean, obviously you're going to see it and be like, I need to know what Liz thinks about this. If you see anything that's in the nursing healthcare realm that you would like me to give you all of my feelings about, I very much appreciate if you tag me in it or send it over to me. Um, these are feeding my soul. It's been good. It's like therapy for me to <laughs> go through these and hopefully give you guys some tips of what to see and recognize so that we can see as a profession, like this behavior is not okay. It took me 10 years to realize it for myself. I've talked about this before that it took me 10 years to realize like, oh, this treatment is not normal. And I would love for it to take you much less than 10 years. And we do that by talking about it. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. And again, if you want to check out a video where we talk more about how nursing tends to take advantage of people and how you can avoid that when you are looking for jobs and 
seeing how employers talk to you in general and like some early red flag warning signs. I will leave that video linked right here and you can go check it out. Bye friends.